So I have to ask, so you brought up, you know, the idea of a progressive regime, we hear that word. So do you consider yourself a progressive? Are you joining the Progressive Caucus? Where, you know, where do you kind of fit in with this label? I think, um, I think that if you look at my body of work, for example, um, in my district, I have the only lactation station in, community, in, in uh, city government. I have the second lactation, the pu I have the second public lactation station in the state which is a real forward idea, which gives a reasonable accommodation for women returning to work who want to nurse their children or express milk and store it, right? So it sounds crazy for a man to be saying that, but like I said, I have six kids, and my wife uh, was under tremendous scrutiny as a family who was in the public eye to be breastfeeding in public, which was bizarre to me. So we said the first thing we're going to do is provide an environment, not only in my office and in my district, but in city government that's conducive for those kind of progressive ideals. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have that, you have the fact that no one on my staff is allowed to drive for the first year because we have a commitment to reducing our, car our carbon footprint as well as setting a tone for ex exercise within the district. So we have a, the, the probably, arguably, one of the most progressive agendas in, in, in city government. And, and this station that you mentioned, this is at, in your district office? In my district you, office. you created space. We, we did a, a build-out. Uh -huh. um, we have uh, uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, or Central Brooklyn in general, has uh, a breastfeeding empowerment zone, which the advocates are going bonkers for, if you, if you, if you look it up. We, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a public lactation station, which is kind of unheard of. That's why it's only the second one in the state, which means that anybody in the vicinity who wants to access that for whatever reason has access to that in my office. And is that something that... You mentioned Councilmember Cumbo, chair of the Women's Committee. So is that something she's taken note of? And oh, absolutely. So we're doing a big ribbon cutting ceremony on uh, uh, May sixth, and and she'll be there, and the speaker will be there, and and all of the advocates will be there. On a weekly basis, we actually have because we've partnered with the Breastfeeding Empowerment Zone and uh, uh, and WIC and all of these kind of organizations. We have traffic on a daily basis of people accessing that. We have we have families. We have we have women. We have like it's a, I you know I think it's one of the things I'm most proud of, and I say that because those are progressive things. Like so, saying I'm a progressive and not doing progressive things would be counterproductive for me. So just being as progressive as I can, you know, and if I fall in that range, it would be terrific. Uh, we'll let the chips fall where they may. Uh, some of my best friends in council consider themselves to be on the Progressive Caucus, and that includes Helen Rosenthal and Antonio Reynoso and Carlos Menchaca and Lori Cumbo. These are people who I share ideas with. Um, have I joined the Progressive Caucus? In theory, no, because I haven't signed up. Mm -hmm. But if you ask any of those people I men mentioned who are staunch progressives and our leadership in the Progressive Caucus, they would consider me a partner. And this is something I hear from council members at various times in terms of Caucus, no caucus. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing my my legislating and I'm doing my work, and you know, we can worry about labels later. Absolutely. Of that nature. So it sounds like you're and echoing that. I'm sorry. He's also the, the only councilman who has the art and education, uh, art and oh, and best. oh, I'm sorry. We have we actually have in our office have hired uh, an ambassador to arts and culture because we believe that under the under the a uh, heavy weight of gentrification. If you protect your institutions, you'll survive whatever wave of gentrification. Mm -hmm. Those communities that haven't survived under gentrification haven't done enough to, pr pr to protect their culture. So we have someone who deals directly with all of the cultural institutions in the area and also builds capacity within those to provide arts education, to do all those kinds of things. And that's kind of a bold initiative to have someone on staff that does solely that, mm -hmm. but we thought that that was inc incredibly important, especially in a district that's under the crunch. And so what, do you, so, so what does that mean to you? I know like you know, Spike Lee went on his rant and you know, there's been a lot of things written and, and spoken about. So what, what do you see happening, you know, you say under the crunch, you know, what? Well, so it's obvious that where, uh, where uh, certain demographics are moving in and driving up rents, it, it, it makes it less likely for someone who is uh, indigenous to a particular community to stay because economically they can no longer afford that. So that's a very secular thing that happens. It's happening in Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights. It's happening all over the city. Um, and so there's no exception 
with, with Bedford Stuyvesant. The way you safeguard, and, and unfortunately, gentrification for the city of New York is something that we're trying, we're attempting to put the brakes on by having more affordable housing units. Um, but gentrification is not just about housing. It's about, like I said, you know, protecting cultural institutions, but also there is, for us, an opportunity with gentrification. If I build capacity within my businesses to service the new, the, the new migrants to the area, then they so there are, there are businesses that have been in, in my district for 50 years. Mm -hmm. If you give them capacity and prepare them for new people coming in, then their businesses will grow because that's a whole new, you know, the funny thing about capitalism is it has to grow in order for it to exist, right? And we live in a capitalist society. How do I get my businesses prepared to grow to meet the demand of new people coming in? That's, from a business perspective, that's a great problem to have. If you ask businesses across the world, if they, right. if they could say what they would want to do, I need more people to buy my goods and services. Here it is that we have more people to buy your goods and services. How do we drive, how do you market yourself? How do we drive more people to those businesses? So I'm tasked with protecting the housing stock for individuals who've, li who's li who've lived there all their lives, but I'm also tasked with building capacity within business so that they can receive and benefit from new people moving in. So, you know, from my vantage point, it's a very unique problem, right? And it's not one dimensional, mm -hmm. right? So some of us believe that a rising tide lifts all ships. Well, if I put, us, put that community in a place to, to benefit monetarily, um, then it'll grow. Most people who are facing increased rents don't say they don't want to pay the rent. They want to wage that will allow them to keep pace mm -hmm. with the growing. So, so the average person doesn't want you to stop anything. They want to keep pace. So how do I help them keep they pace? Make, right, so they, what, they, what they're looking for you is some help with facilitation so that they can keep up with some, of the, some of the trends that are happening, but they're not necessarily then pushed elsewhere. Absolutely. Interesting.